Friends, good afternoon. I'm sure you've taken your lunchbox and sat down for this very important and interesting session on a variety of topics, which is to do with simplifying complex PCI. And we have the greatest of the masters here to talk to us about that. We realize that we rely on the stent to give the best outcomes for our patient, and stent technology has improved tremendously. The drug eluting stent technology has progressed by leaps and bounds over the last 15 years. And there are a variety of designs, polymers, and drugs. And we have inundated with a new stent every year, a new design every year, a new advancement, a new iteration. So it's important for us to understand do these drugs and stents, as they progress in terms of technology, design, and drugs, does it make a difference to our patients? in giving them the safest and the best outcomes. We also rely these days on the vast amount of knowledge which is being gained from intravascular imaging. Again, with a single intention that our patients should do well, that they should have the least complications and the best possible long-term results. We realized the benefit of intravascular imaging as far ago as 28 years ago when metallic stents came in and stent thrombosis used to be high. There were inadequate antiplatelet therapy and the single thing intravascular imaging told us even at that time, intravascular ultrasound is, you optimize the stent and you actually decrease thrombosis rates. And we've seen that happen over a period of time. So what knowledge do we gain from the new tools and technologies of intravascular imaging? And finally, we're going to cover this very interesting topic of ischemia and non-obstructive coronary arteries. An entity which has gained even more importance in the present era as we've realized that the prognosis of these people who have ischemia without non-obstructive coronary artery disease is at worst, is not the same as those without, non without uh, ischemia. And they have a higher mortality. And if we need to understand more about microvascular dysfunction or vasospasm, both of which are indicators of Inoka. So the real learning objectives of this program is that we want to understand the influence of drug, polymer, and stent design on the procedural short and long-term outcomes for our patients. We want to define the use of intravascular imaging in complex coronary lesions to optimize our results and give us the best outcome for our patients. And we also need to understand the role prevalence and diagnosis of microvascular dis dysfunction in our patients with, of ischemia with normal coronary arteries. My name is Ashok Seyat, I'm from New Delhi, India, and the moderator for today's session is Adrian Lowe from Singapore. We have expert discussants in our panel, Dr. Mahesh from India, Dr. Sarita Rao from India, there's Shiv Kumar Ratnawal, Tanuj Bhatia, Aaron Wong from Singapore. The speakers today are truly the masters. Tegu Santoso from Indonesia, Dr. Singatuvelu from India, and Dr. Pratap Kumar from India. The chat master is Manish Narang. I urge you to chat, to join the slido.com, put your questions in, we will see them here. We will address them, we will answer them. You can come onto the mic, you can talk to us. We want this to be an interactive session in the time given. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ashok, for that uh, very comprehensive introduction. I think we do have a lot of ground to cover. So in the interest of time, I'll just uh, provide an overview of the, the audience interaction. So to, uh, I think you can access the, the session on your app. And if you have any questions, feel free to, to share it on the apps or and we will try our best to answer it among the panelists or the chat master to, uh, Manish might also try and answer some of the questions. So without further ado, we'll have uh, Dr. Sangatu Velo to kick off this meeting with his lecture on DES. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you. So does DES design influence patient outcomes? So I do not have any conflict of interest. So let me start with a few of my cases uh, initially. So this is one of our cases, if you can uh, carefully see, look at the stent boost image. 
uh, you have a, a, a clearly a waist in the stent, in the proximal portion of the stent, it's a quite long stent. And uh, what we have done is we have dilated with a post dilated with a high pressure balloon. And then you can see the waist shifting down. You can see in this image on the right, I don't know whether you're able to appreciate it. So, so it's kind of, uh, sometimes this happens when you don't have a very good uh, radial strength. And this is one of our earlier cases where it's a bifurcation where we put uh, two uh, uh, promus stents. And if you can see that, uh, the, when we put the second stent through the first stent, there was significant uh, shortening of the, even the proximal portion with uh, longitudinal stent uh, decompression and uh, where you can deformation, where you can see also in the OCT, uh, you have multiple layers of uh, distorted stents. So, and this results in clinical outcomes where you can see, uh, this is a follow-up where you can see an uh, instant restenosis uh, involving both the main and the side branch. And uh, you can see uh, another example where we have done uh, another patient, another patient where uh, you can see the stents, even the osteal stenting, uh, quite remain very well uh, after uh, stenting and with, with the guiding catheters coming close to the stent. So it's important to take note of that. And uh, uh, also examples of uh, late stent fractures, particularly when you use long stents. We have seen this, uh, and you can see the polymer also getting damaged during the fracture. And... Uh, uh, this can particularly happen with uh, both the uh, cobalt chromium and platinum chromium erborolimus saluting stents. Uh, and this is again translates into clinical events like restenosis and stent thrombosis. And with this uh, examples of case uh, examples, I would also uh, want to take your attention to this uh, important uh, analysis of drug eluting stents, 17 randomized control trials. Uh, this has been zero and one year and one and five years. We could still uh, see that with, with uh, various stents, uh, uh, first generation and second generation drug eluting stents, you still see beyond one year, you could still see there is an event rate of 2% per year and every year it continues. So do we need further improvements on stents? Of course, yes. That is to further eliminate yearly and st late stent failure, restenosis and stent thrombosis, reduce the need for long-term DAPT, and also to improve the lifelong prognosis after drug eluting stents. So let me take you to the basics, the drug eluting stent design. So we know that it has three important components. One is a stent scaffold, that is a basic back backbone or the skeleton of the stent, and then the polymer, which is important, which controls the drug release uh, of the antiproliferative agent. And uh, finally, the antiproliferative drug, which is very important to inhibit uh, cellular proliferation. So now let us talk in more detail about the, the backbone or the stent scaffold. The stent scaffold, again, is very important because it influences the radial strength, the longitudinal strength, as well as the deliverability and the conformability, also the visibility depending on the metal what we use. So the type of metal, again, we need to know. Earlier, we were using stainless steel. And now, I think we have now, most of the stents have either cobalt chromium or platinum chromium. Both are biocompatible and biologically inert. And the thickness of the stent is again now coming into a more importance. Uh, earlier, stents like stainless steel stents were more than 100 micron thick. And they were designated as thicker stents. And uh, up to 70 microns, it is considered as thin struts. And uh, less than 70 now recently has been classified as ultra thin stents. And now we are seeing some good results. Uh, we have seen that the thin stents have actually uh, caused less injury because it occupies a smaller surface area and thereby lowering the inflammation. And probably the endothelialization is faster, which leading to reduced thrombus formation and neointimal hyperplasia. So uh, other than the metal alloy and the thickness is the stent architecture. Earlier, we know that uh, the stents were coiled wire, which was uh, very flexible, but didn't have good radial strength. And the slotted tube, uh, the Palma Shard stent, which is very rigid, but flexible, uh, but not flexibility was not there. So now we have more of a modular architecture. Uh, what we, uh, more important thing is to know about the stent alloy platform is the yield strength and the elastic modulus. So yield strength is basically the maximum stress that can be applied to a stent before the stent gets deformed. That actually influences the capacity of the stent to expand. And the elastic modulus is a measure of stent's ability to resist deformation when we apply stress. So uh, if the lower the elastic modulus implies less stiffness so that we can improve stacking and conformability of the stent. So the most common metal alloy are cobalt chromium and platinum chromium. 
uh, which uh, have the high elastic modulus compared uh, and cobalt chromium has higher elastic modulus and if you look at the graph the tensile strength is highest with uh, cobalt chromium and the lowest with uh, stainless steel. So the earlier sense as I mentioned was continuous wire or solid tube and now we are more having a modular architecture which consists of repeating hoops that form a tube. Uh, this actually increases greater uh, radial force and not compromising on the flexibility. So this is how uh, modular architecture looks. Uh, hoops uh, is a modular architecture, it's linked by connectors. You can see the connectors, the number of connectors actually define the size of the stent cell and also the stent's uh, flexibility and uh, the deliverability and the conformability. So actually the design is a trade-off. So if you reduce the number of connectors, uh, it can improve the flexibility of the stent but uh, it, it decreases the longitudinal strength, uh, so uh, causing longitudinal strength deformation. So increasing flexibility actually, uh, actually reduces the uh, potential to fracture. So the stent cell is actually the area between two consecutive rings and their connectors. So the, the uh, modular architecture can be either an open cell or a closed cell. This is an open cell design and you have a closed cell design. Most of the contemporary stents are now open cell designs. The advantage of having an open cell design is uh, you have uh, the less metal to uh, artery ratio, more conformability and have a very good side branch access. Although the radial strength is slightly compromised and there is a higher chance of block prolapse compared to the uh, closed cell design. And you can also note that in uh, kind of tortuous vessels, you have a can gap can be caused in uh, resulting in lower drug concentration in open cell design. And we have a number of designs, uh, as you can see, depending on the design, you can see this is a Zions platform, which has got uh, uh, connectors, uh, low artery to metal ratio. Uh, it has got three link peak to valley connection, got good radial strength. And uh, similarly, there are a number of variations. And if you off note is uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Synergy strength, which is a two link uh, variation where you have the two proximal links. And the proximal portion has got four links. Uh, this they have modified to enhance the uh, longitudinal strength of the stent and uh, uh, so so now let us uh, have some uh, data on uh, whether there is any benefit of using ultra thin ultra thin struts so if you look at uh, the impact of this strength thickness as you can see in the slide as the strut thickness decreases uh, the thrombogenicity also uh, has been shown to decrease and similarly the endothelialization uh, is much more when you have a thinner strut stents. And we have seen this in uh, clinical data. This is uh, one of the, the randomized control trials meta-analysis with uh, three ultra-thin drug relating stents. And we can see that uh, the, the, the most of the data is uh, tend towards favoring the ultra-thin struts, uh, both in uh, stent on, uh, target lesion failure as well as stent thrombosis. So can we now have uh, improvement in polymers and what are the current polymers, uh, what we are using? Polymer, we know that it is very important uh, for to control the drug release kinetics and uh, the ideal polymer uh, must be biocompatible, biologically inert and uh, should not interact with the release of the antiproliferative agent. So uh, again, uh, differences uh, uh, again uh, will result in degrees of stiffness uh, and it can uh, uh, vary in resistance to cracking and uh, drug release kinetics. So most of the recent drug relating stents have now started using bioresorbable polymers so that, that once the drug delivery is accomplished, the polymer is resorbed and it, it turns to a, a bare metal stent so that the long-term uh, issues like uh, hypersensitivity reactions are avoided. So the other thing about the polymer, one of the durable polymer stents, the Zion stent, which has got a fluoropolymer, has been noted to have less thrombogenic potential and uh, this is of uh, interest and it has been shown that uh, this can lead to less inflammation and possibly a potential for reducing the need for longer uh, drug, I mean, DAPT. And uh, interestingly, uh, in the COVID times, uh, they have also done a, a simulation, uh, a cytokine storm simulation, uh, where they have shown that uh, the, uh, the durable polymer, or the fluoropolymer and the zines has shown to have a, a high resistance to stent thrombosis and it has been shown that the platelet aggression was much lower and also in synergy strength, it was shown to have a higher thrombogenicity in a simulated cytokine storm. So what about the data of biodegradable polymers or outcomes improved compared with the regular polymers? Again, this is a meta-analysis uh, which is comparing a durable polymer with a biodegradable polymer. This is again uh, 32 trials, again showing 
uh, no difference, uh, no benefits of uh, biodegradable polymer over the durable polymer drug eluting stents. So are polymer free drug eluting stents the answer? Again, uh, we know that uh, uh, this was a, uh, we know that uh, there is a, a, a biofreedom stent uh, which has shown that in the leaders free trial compared to the bare metal stent, uh, the definitely uh, the, the TLR rates was much uh, better when compared to a uh, bare metal stent. But if you look at uh, uh, comparison with the uh, biodegradable stent versus uh, without a polymer, again, there is no difference. So there is no difference in actually having uh, stents with uh, uh, no polymer. So now let me go in more into the uh, drug itself. So again, uh, drugs are fixed in the polymer and slowly released into the interface of the stent and the arterial wall. So the, the drug actually inhibits uh, proliferation, uh, cellular proliferation, which is an important step for neointimal hyperplasia and restenosis. So we know that uh, Cypher uh, uh, with Sirolimus and uh, Taxus, uh, Paclitaxel was the first generation drugs used. And uh, the serolimus is inhibiting the cell cycle by blocking mTOR, which is a mammalian target of rapamycin, and thereby uh, reducing, uh, inhibiting uh, smooth muscle cell proliferation and migration. Similarly, plaquetaxel, but today I think most of the stents are now uh, studied using serolimus or limus derivatives, and, uh, uh, and uh, most of the, uh, and even sometimes zotralimus, biolimus in some of the stents, but it's highly lipophilic, it's uh, not much used. So most of the data is from uh, Evrolimus and Zotralimus. So the next uh, answer is uh, bioresorbable, uh, bioresorbable stents or BVS. I think we have uh, a lot of experience with the absorb and with the five-year data, you could see that the first one year, uh, uh, you could see the first three years, there was a divergent curve, which means that the absorb had a higher uh, incidence of target lesion failure uh, at five years. But then if you follow beyond three years, you can see that the curves are merging with each other. And in fact, if you follow it for a longer time, maybe there will be advantage of using uh, bioresorbable stents, but we need to have more long-term data. Similarly, the number of other uh, uh, bioresorbable scaffolds are now being studied and uh, they are also, the size of the struts are getting thinner and thinner. So what about uh, some special populations where the DES design has been uh, altered and there are some interest in uh, polymer-free amphilymphus eluting stent, which is found to be non-inferior to uh, cobalt chromium everolimus eluting stent and, and also superior to zotralimus eluting stent. Again, uh, these are again uh, of interest, uh, but in special populations. And we are also now looking at patients who have high bleeding risk. And uh, we know that uh, there was a, a master app study again showing a one month shorter DAPT was non-inferior to three months DAPT. And even the Zion's short DAPT program, uh, both one and three months DAPT were non-inferior to longer duration DAPT. So the bleeding rates were significantly lower with short duration of DAPT. So future directions, novel material designs, uh, creating micro or nanostructures on the stent surface by plasma or chemical etching and non-adhesive surface technology uh, can improve the stent designs and use of polymer-free stents uh, in which uh, uh, that the antiproliferative drug can be kept in cavities or pockets uh, carved into the stent scaffold is an, again uh, another area of interest. The bioresorbable scaffolds, the newer bio, which is going to come, uh, as well as in the market, plus the CD34 antibody coated serolimus eluting stents with the endothelial progenitor cells are again an advantage uh, in, uh, in improving the stent healing earlier. So to summarize the contemporary stent technology, as you can see in this picture, uh, we have this, the, the ultra-thin struts have really contributed to improved healing and faster individualization. And uh, you can also see a bioresorbable polymer where it's coated in the abluminal surface, uh, gets completely absorbed and becomes a bare metal stent. And uh, now the technology is changing where the coating is uh, mainly applied to the abluminal uh, stent area, not in the circumferentially in the struts. And we are now, more, as uh, said before, the more of an open cell design which we are moving to. So to conclude, most stents used in contemporary times are thin strut, durable polymer drug eluting stents that elute everolimus or zotralimus, the biocompatible fluoropolymer used on the everolimus eluting cobalt chromium stent is associated with less thrombogenicity compared to bioabsorbable polymers. The mechanical properties of the stent remain intact, which means the longitudinal stent deformation and strut fracture
can cause adverse effects, particularly thin struts and more flexible stents like the, uh, the platinum chromium stents can be more prone to uh, longitudinal distortion. So iterative improvements are being made in stent configuration, polymers on the abluminal surface, bioresorbable polymers, and new antiproliferate agents, but really difficult to improve clinical outcomes further. It has been an exciting time with ups and downs, but the best is yet to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singer Tuvelu. That was a com very comprehensive coverage of the present science and art of a drug eluding stent. So just let me ask you, or I'd rather ask the panel, Tegu, uh, do you believe that the stents should get thinner and thinner? There's going to be a trade-off if stents get thinner and thinner. Uh, are we just intending to decrease thrombosis and yet lose, have a recoil? What do you, what's your concept around, around where we're going in terms of new stent technology? Ah, Tegu, it's for you. Oh, me. You heard my question? <laughs> you heard my question? Yes. Thinner stress is it? Yes, yes, but uh, I think this is, this is a, uh, an, an important issue, but uh, in clinical practice, uh, I almost never encountered this in, a, in, in a, our day-to-day -day life, uh, life practice. So uh, I, I, I must admit that I love uh, thin struts, even ultra-thin struts, and I never encountered this problem a, a lot in my practice. And what I like about uh, these thin struts or ultra-thin struts is, is, is flexibility and it can cross a, a very challenging lesion like a long lesion or calcified lesion, publication, torturous lesion very easily. And so far, uh, among the publications that uh, we have uh, right now, the uh, TLR, TVR, and uh, MACE is, uh, uh, are comparable. So, uh, may I ask a question? Yeah, so, uh, how thin is too thin? But the question is because every time we go thinner on the struts, we do compromise the radial strength of the stent. So, uh, how thin do we want to go? And will it not compromise the radial force? Yeah. Because there are, there are strengths which are fit. I think some, you know, I think the mics are sequentially connected. So, so when, if it, if it switched off, then only I can switch on. Yeah. So uh, there are stents which have gone as thin as 50 microns. Now that, I wonder what would happen to the complex calcified lesions that we now deal with very commonly. And our lesions are getting more and more complex. Any thoughts on that? Yes, Mahesh. So the, uh, from whatever Dr. Sengotovil has said so far, we should have a, a, a seven, less than 70 microns open cell with no polymer, zotrolimus or everolimus diluting thing, which delivers drug for 90 days and then disappears. This will be your ideal stent that we're looking forward. I think we've got a long way to go for that. I, I wonder whether there's ever going to be an ideal stent in those circumstances, because invariably there's going to be some trade-off or the other. But let me just ask you, and starting from, from uh, Pratap, Pratap, what, what do you look for in your stent? Give me one quality which you think is the most important. Is it crossability? Is it, is it low thrombogenicity? Is it uh, good radial strength? Uh, is it radi radio opacity? Is it crossing the side branches? So all, yeah. all qualities should be there. Okay, you're not actually. going to get all. So you, you're going to tell me <laughs> I what just is your to... important one. Actually, in a stent, uh, long-term availability with a less thrombogenicity will be my look for. That is actually, that is what everybody wants. That is why we want the drug limiting stent to become bare metal stent after some time to, for the less thrombogenicity. And the polymer and the drug and all, only for the shorter duration we want. But you ask that what should be the shorter, the shorter. But I think less than 50 will be a real problem for calcified lesions. Absolutely. I think it would be an incredible problem. Uh, so I think, uh, Aaron, uh, in, your, in your practice, side branch access, is that a major issue? Now, the, I, I'm talking about the strengths. Struts can be flat or they can be rounded. I have a feeling that the rounded struts lead to less side branch occlusion or at least less side branch coverage and easier passage of your wires into the side branch for you to deal with them. 
What's your, what's, what do you think about uh, access to side branches and what's your concept around that? Um, yes, I think bifurcation lesions you know, happens 30-40% of our usual intervention. But from my experience, most of the stent, um, crossing the stent shrouds is not an issue. The problem is that it, it, in a closed cell, that you, if you, you can't expand it well, if you need to do a two stents technique, there may be a, you know, a limit, restriction of the ostium of the thing. So uh, for open cell designs, it's a, it's a, good, uh, it's a better option for cell. So, uh, uh, side branch access. I, yeah. And not just access, I believe that lead, they need to lesser closure of the, also the side Oh, yes, branch. yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we got, could go on to the next talk in the, uh, as we are timed for finishing this session in an hour and a half, but I think we're going to have 10 minutes at the end for discussion, and that's going to be a good time to discuss. So I think we could actually move on to the next uh, talk, which is the role of imaging in complex calcified lesion by Dr. Santoso. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ashok uh, My task is uh, to discuss the, the role of imaging in complex lesions. I have nothing to disclose. We all know that the lesion preparation in moderate to severe calcification is of utmost importance because it allows easier stand delivery, less vigorous uh, manipulation of DES, and it allows uh, better stand expansion, better local delivery of the drug, and also less risk of post-standing complications such as dissection, dislodgements, or vessel perforations. So for this, we, we uh, definitely need intravascular imaging. So it is a prerequisite. Uh, there are two types of imaging modality that we use uh, in our CAD lab. In our lab, uh, one is OCT, and the other one is, of course, uh, IFUS. With OCT and IFOS, we can calculate scores of pulmonary calcium, and with this, we can predict stent expansion. So we normally use uh, calcium thickness, calcium arc, length, uh, circumferential calcium, diameter, and uh, calcium nodules to get the number, the, the scores, and based on this, we can define whether we should embark on doing uh, more aggressive intervention like, uh, for example, using uh, arthroplective techniques, so IVL. Nodular calcifications is a unique uh, feature. This is a calcified uh, uh, plaque projecting into the uh, vessel lumen, and this can easily identify it with uh, this uh, imaging modality, and we can also assess the result of our treatment with uh, IFUS and our OCT. On top of that, we still need uh, calcium fractures to get a good platform uh, of our sand and get the optimal sand expansion. This is just a, an example of uh, OCT and uh, uh, IFUS findings of calcium uh, cracks after uh, doing uh, rotational uh, or arthrectomy procedures and high pressure balloon, dilata that balloon dilatation. We also know that uh, the stand expansion would be much better if we do arthrectomy as part of our lesion preparation. The relative utility of IFUS versus OCT in calcified lesion is as follows. For aorto osteal lesion, of course, uh, we should use IFUS and not OCT. Bifurcation and vein graft, we can use both. For left main, sometimes, especially if the left main is short and big, uh, we encounter problem with OCT, but uh, we can use guideliner. For ISR, OCT is better. For CDO, IFOS is better. For sand sizing, both can be used. For chronic kidney disease, we still can use OCT if we use saline or gelofusin because we have to limit the amount of contrast utilization. I will give two examples where we uh, use uh, OCT and uh, IFOS. This is a case example of using OCT. A patient presented with angina on effort. Calcium score is 2,500. High euro score. This is OCT guided, and we need to do orbital arthrectomy. Looking at the critical lesion, the severity of the lesions here in the distal left main and also the proximal LED, 
of course, we need to uh, do pre-dilatation before we can uh, get good OCT images. This is just a, a run, OCT run from LED to left main. And I think you will agree with me that the patient has a, a, a long, uh, heavily calcified, thick calcified, and uh, in many parts, uh, napkin ring calcifications. These are just to show the subframe images. Of course, we need to apply the so-called MLED max. For morphology, you'll see here diffuse calcifications of more than uh, 180 degree. And uh, of course, after this, uh, uh, we need to assess the, side, the other side plans. This is uh, LCX left main. And you'll see here that uh, in the subframe images, yeah, the LCX is a bigger vessel, but there is thrombus and uh, calcifications. And uh, vessel is uh, bigger, but again, you, you see a lot of calcifications. We, do, we did also a uh, functional assessment, and on both branches, uh, these, the, the values were subnormal. And after doing this uh, uh, preliminary OCT, we need to do lesion preparation. And then this is the, or, or after orbital atherectomy and high pressure balloon dilatation, you will agree with me that uh, we have induced a lot of cracks along the vessels. And calcium modification was defined as round concave here indicated by dotted yellow line, polished calcium surface, and also indicated by asterisks. We have also induced uh, calcium fractures and dissection. In other words, we already have a good stand floor platform for our stand. And this is the excellent uh, angiographic result after implantation of uh, DES and uh, in the uh, left main publication, we use TK Grass technique. And this is the OCT uh, runoff uh, pullback uh, from LED to left main. Uh, you will agree with me that stand were well, ex well posed, well expanded. Stop frame images, uh, this is the max, MLED max, this is the max, showing here that uh, no med medial dissection, no edge dissection, stand were all well opposed in all parts, and uh, well expanded, more than 80, even up to more than 100%. This is a, a pullback uh, OCT from uh, LCX to left main, and this is the 3D uh, view, Showing here a big uh, side plans opening of the cirque, a stand with well opposed. This is the max uh, showing here uh, again no medial dissection, no edge dissection, well opposed stand, and well expanded more than 80%. Of course, uh, QR on both branches uh, became normal. This is a, a case example where IFOS was used. This uh, uh, patient has a uh, chronic kidney disease, stage five. Of course, uh, we need to uh, limit the, the amount of contrast utilizations. The patient has heavily calcif uh, cal heavy calcifications, very useful for patients with uh, chronic kidney disease. This uh, baseline uh, cat was done in another hospital, and uh, these lesions were all resistant to high-pressure balloon dilatation. We need to do uh, orbital atherectomy procedures, and after this, uh, the lesions yielded to balloon dilatation, just to show here the OCT findings. And this is an excellent result after using only uh, 5 cc of contrast, but of course, we need uh, intravascular imaging, and in this particular case, we use uh, IFUS. So, IFUS and also uh, uh, OCT are indispensable for uh, a good re uh, to obtain good result in moderate to severely uh, calcified lesions. This is uh, one of the most uh, widely adopted algorithm for the treatment of calcified lesions. You'll see here, uh, even in this, uh, in most uh, 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 algorithm we need to use uh, IFOS and or OCT. For example, in this uh, algorithm, uh, if the uh, calcium score is five or more by OCT and or uh, IFOS, we can use a little trip C if our balloon can cross, but if the, our balloon cannot cross or the lesion is uncrossable, then we need to proceed with atherectomy procedures like a ro a rotational atherectomy or orbital atherectomy. But there are several uh, conditions which are never or not mentioned in all algorithm. And for this, we still also need intravascular imaging to identify 
this condition. One is calcification in patients exhibiting acute coronary syndrome. This uh, can be caused by black ruptures with a lot of thrombus, erosion, and so on. But calcified noodle may also cause uh, acute coronary syndrome. In this situation, of course, we know that uh, rota and orbital atrectomy are contraindicated. Even RVL may also result in thrombus de degradation and embolization because of uh, insonification of platelet rich thrombus. So, usually the strategy is uh, after restoration of TME flow, flow, we can uh, plan the procedure as stage procedure. Procedure uh, can be temporarily uh, terminated until thrombus dissolved. And this is uh, another situation. Again, in this situation, we need an intravascular imaging, calcification, and instant resinosis, never mentioned in the algorithm. You'll see here uh, proliferative instant resinosis instant inside the SVG LCX graph. The proximal end of the stand protruded into the aorta. So uh, in this situation, we need to use stand ablation, calcium ablation as well. And this is, of course, off-label use of orbital arthrectomy. We need to use a microcatheter to help uh, assist the procedure. Guideliner assisted balloon dilatation followed by guideliner assisted OIS. This is after POBA, this is after orbital atrectomy and further POBA. Uh, we get a bigger and smoother lumen and as a result of calcium and stent ablation. Just to show here uh, our result, this is after orbital atrectomy and further balloon dilatation. Of course, you see here a bigger lumen diameter, concave surface, uh, polished surface, uh, and calcium cracks only in, in segment where uh, uh, there is no stent shrudge. This is uh, the excellent result after a stent implantation. You'll agree with me that the, uh, the result is very well, uh, very well acceptable, acceptable, well opposed, well accepted, uh, uh, expanded stent. The third uh, situation never mentioned in uh, our algorithm is calcified bifurcation. If we have a situation like this where uh, we have a, a lot of calcium in the opposite si wall, the opposite side of the side branch here, and we don't prepare the lesion well, uh, after stand implantation, we will uh, pinch uh, this side branch osseum uh, because of corona shift. So we need to identify this, but this can only be possible by using intravascular imaging. Just to show here a case example where you have here a lot of calcium. The side branch is uh, very much patent here, big side branch, but after stenting, you get a severe pinching of the side branch osteum as shown here. But if you do a lesion, proper lesion preparation, this is another case, uh, rota, uh, and then followed by cutting balloon, you implant a stand, you, you will get good, better result with almost no side branch complications. So to sum up, moderate to severe calcification is present in approximately 30% of coronary lesions in patients with uh, stable ischemic heart disease and acute coronary syndrome. Intravascular imaging, I for so OCT is essential to get proper lesion preparation including calcium factors, and this proper lesion preparation is essential to obtain a good short and long-term outcome. Thank you so much. So thank you very much. Uh, Tegu, I think the obvious question in all this was, uh, unless I missed it, is what is your imaging of choice? Given that the renal function's fine and so on and so forth, uh, what's your imaging of choice in calcified lesions? And no why? special preference, I use both. Yeah, but I mean, you use both means that you have both, but not everybody has both. Uh, and therefore, I want a message as to what is, uh, and you can't use both in the same patient, you've got to use one or the other. So how do you decide? Uh, this is an abet sponsored session. <laughs> I must say that uh, in my hospital, I use IFOS more than uh, OCT, but uh, I find that uh, OCT is also very, very helpful. 
So, so especially in calcified lesion, we can so, better define the thickness of the calcium, length, and and also the arc much much better than IFS. So, 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 Sarita, what what about yourself? We, No, no. So I think uh, both the modalities have their own benefits and uh, preferences. Uh, a lot of times when we have a lot of deep calcium, we are able to visualize it better with the OCT. But OCT has the problems of, uh, you know, a lot of dye being used. Of course, now we use saline. So um, that helps us. Um, so with deep calcium, a lot of the time we like to use OCT. But if you're looking at a left main lesion, uh, then you would definitely think of using an IVAS. So, Dr. Singer, you had some ideas. I mean, I've uh -huh. said that this is not left main. I've said that the <laughs> renal function is fine. Uh, uh -huh. And you have the option of using both. <laughs> I, 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 even though both options are fine, there are two specific advantages of OCT. One would be thickness of calcium, as they already elaborated. And the second, when you do a post-tent evaluation, the apposition is better appreciated with OCT because the stent frames are bright and the calcium is also bright. When the IVS, it will be difficult to interpret the good apposition, whereas in OCT, it will be very clear. So OCT has got some mild advantage, but you can use either. So I think we covered, covered that part of it. Uh, the bifurcations are coming. Anything from your 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 end? Uh... Um, nothing to add. Now I think we should uh, just carry on with the lectures. Uh, in the interest of time, then we can have a further discussion okay. later. Sure. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Pratap Kumar. He's going to just share with us uh, his strategy in bifurcation lesion, specifically the role of imaging. With respect to chairperson, actually, the uh, OCT in bifurcation PCI. OCT combined with angioco registration, actually, especially with the 3D construction, facilitate the guide by recrossing towards the side branch. And it is recommended that it is used when faced with technical complex challenges and procedural complications. So what are the advantages of OCT in bifurcation? Number one is superior resolution. Number two, the quantification of the calcium burden, especially arc thickness and longitudinal extent. Three is the pre-dilatation results. Four, guide wire position. And finally, the side branch osteum analysis. When you look at the IVS versus OCT, you have a plaque characterization is better with IVS, but we can see that the assessment of the side branch osteum in the pullback of the main branch alone with, with one IVS run what one OCT run, you will be able to see the side branch in OCT. Number two, the during stent implantation, the guidance of the position of the guide wire towards the side branch, again, analyzed by OCT. The edge dissection is better seen with OCT, as Sengot will told, the post stent implantation that makes a very important situation. But there are people actually have some, uh, they face some challenges in OCT sometimes inadequate flushing of the vessel. Second is actually the guide wire shadows can cover a side branch osteum, but you have to manipulate the guide wire, repeat the pullback to obtain the essential information. Number three is actually advancing the stiff OCT catheter. You can, can cause some dissection influenced by side branch, but you should be gentle with whether it is OCT or IVS catheter. The number four actually kindly avoid recrossing into a jail side branch with OCT catheter. And co-registration is actually, you have to identify the proper view and some that is a major position that you may not get the proper understanding. So actually these are the tips and tricks. And co-registration, use of online co-registration of OCT and angiogram may facilitate the precise guidance of the bifurcation PCI. So actually in 3D OCT is important to understand, recognize anatomical changes after intervention than a 2D OCT, especially for the carinal shift. So that we, unlike with IVS, 3D assessment of the side branch osteal area from the OCT pullback of the main vessel is good substitute for a pullback from the side branch. You don't have to go do 
to uh, pull back for the uh, OCT all the time. Both is actually available with the Illumin as well as in uh, Thermo because especially automatically recognized Oscarina as well as the side branch Ostia with a diameter of more than 1.5 millimeters. Actually, the cut plane analysis, the quantitative assessment of the side branch Ostium by the OCT pullback from the main branch in a cross section, which is perpendicular to the side branch center line. It is actually having a higher correlation with the reference measurements performed in a side branch Ostium pullback. So the OCT assessment in side branch Ostium, OCT pullback remains the gold standard naturally, but even then you can go with only one pullback. The role of OCT in bifurcation PCI. Number one is a lesion assessment. Number two is a stenting strategy. Number three is the measurement of the stent size. You can assess the length and the position of the stent in bifurcation and the guidance of the rewiring and post-procedural assessment. How do you understand the pre-procedural lesion assessment? Especially when the assessment of the calcium by OCT should indi could indicate which lesion preparation should be performed. That is definitely, it is an advantage over IVAS. The pre-procedural bifurcation angle could be derived from the OCT pullback from the main vessel. When you look at the lesion distribution, you can see the atherosclerotic plaques are observed in the lateral wall, whereas the flow divided regions are spared. So the, how do you predict the side branch compromise? The assessment of the OCT area, it is suggested the OCT pullback should be obtained from both main vessel as from the side branch. But the most important factor affecting the selection of interventional strategy in the bifurcation lesion is the risk of side branch occlusion. So the, what are the causes of the side branch compromise? One, the atheromatous plaque shift from the main vessel to the side branch. You can have a cardinal shift. The presence of the stent strut covering the side branch ostium, coronary vasospasm, and the formation of the thrombus. So there's no pluff effect. Actually, the, mitro, uh, the main vessel standing in the presence of a large atheromatous plaque around the bifurcation is associated with the plaque shift. So the presence of the side branch stenosis, it is the strongest predictor. You can have a bifurcation angle, especially which is not, cannot be tackled by a wire and a lesion length. You look at the revolved score system that actually identifies the plaque distribution, especially at the same time. At the same side of the side branch, it is given one point. The Timmy flow gradient less than one is actually 11 or 17 points. Uh, diameter stenosis of the bifurcation core, actually if it is more than three, more than 70%, it is actually having a three point. Bifurcation angle more than 90, it is actually six points. And the diameter ratio between the main vessel and the side branch, if it is more than two, again it is nine points. And the diameter stenosis of the side branch before the main vessel standing of more than 90% is 7. If you take these points together, if it is more than 10, there is actually a high risk group usually. So the IVS predictors again is there. It is not that it is not there. Larger plaque burden, lower lumen well, volume index, side branch MLA. So the spiky carina or the eyebrow sign, especially in IVS, basically the presence of a spiky carina with a variable length and orientation, it's a powerful predictor of the side branch osteal, uh, side branch compromise. Now, your study actually correlated with the cardinal shift, but not with the plaque shift. Basically, you look at the OCT, the side branch angle, if it is more than 50 degree, and the bifurcation, the branch point to the cardinal tip length of more than 1.7 millimeters indicate that this patient can go with a single vessel stent, single stent in bifurcation. So if you look at the length between the proximal branching point and the cardinal tip, if it is more than 1.7, you can just leave it. If it is less than 1.7 or the cardinal tip angle is less than 50, you are, you should think about a two branch technique, a two uh, stent technique in bifurcation. The eccentric plaque distribution oriented towards opposite side of the uh, side branch and the CT, narrower CT angle and the shorter BPCT length, you are the independent predictors of the uh, definitely the side branch occlusion. And you should understand that in the plaque burden in the side branch, especially if the maximum lipid arc and the presence of a lipid plaque correlated definitely with the highest side branch stenosis. So the OCT detected layers of the pattern, so five millimeters, proximal or distal, it's very important, proximal or distal, five millimeter, and especially across, these are also predictors of the side branch occlusion. 
So the decision making on standing strategy during OCT, the complex lesion with a larger calcified side branch with osteal disease, extending of five millimeters from the carina, number one, the two stent strategy up front, and the bifurcation with the side branch whose access is particularly challenging. Number, the next point is the stent size measurement. You can actually stent size measurement, you have to go with the EEL or the lumen. EEL again, you adjust to nearly 0.25 millimeters to the nearest stent size. And if EEL could not be visualized, you can take a proximal and distal vessel reference. And preferably for the distal vessel reference, if both are not seen, and the proximal vessel, you can go with a higher balloon size to keep nearly 6 to 8 millimeters proximal to the side branch so that you can take a, a sufficient port size balloon to inflate the, uh, the proximal part. And the guidance of the rewiring and recrossing the position before the final kissing balloon inflation is important to reduce the incidence of incomplete stent apposition. So you actually, we will think that the proximal recrossing is not as good. Actually, the distal recrossing is okay. A non-distal is the best one. And the better osteal side branch stent coverage and the better apposition you will get distal recrossing. The optimal recrossing is not possible. It should be the last stent strut that is a that should be the distal ring should be the ideal one. If it is not there, the second last will be the ideal one to get into that. The feasibility of assessment of the guide wire recrossing point after the main vessel standing is 90%. And sometimes you have a failure, especially 15%. Recrossing position may be hidden by your thrombus or the guide wire. And the slow pullback definitely will help you to understand that. When the balloons cannot be advanced to the jail wire because of the eccentric wire position and abluminal side branch, you should understand these are both can be identified very well with the OCT. So the OCT can identify that. And second is the eccentric wire position after rewiring, balloon could not be advanced. So the post procedure is the next one. The stent expansion should be evaluated separately in the proximal main vessel, distal main vessel and side branch with respect to each reference area. The stent malaposition is more common at the proximal main vessel and the tissue prolapse on the section at the distal vessel segment. So the incomplete stent apposition means if it is more than 300 microns with a longitudinal extension of more than 1 millimeter, edge dissection is actually important if the dissection is more than 200 microns. I will show you a case, actually it's a bifurcation case, uh, DK crush we have done. This patient had a stent in the lady as well as in the circumflex. You have significant lesion by angiographically in both lesions. It was a live case I have done. We have see, we can see the stent even by just a fluoro. We have taken the wire down. We have taken a 7 French uh, EBU 3.5 catheter. The first wire gone. F the, both the wires are kept in the circumflex as well as the LAD. We just did a pre-dilatation to understand before that. We did the first OCT run from the LAD to the LMCA. What will, this is actually pre-run LAD. We got distal LAD measurement of 3.53, which was actually earlier stented segment. 5.38 and a 9.65, the mid and the proximal LAD part. We just go into the non-standard segment of LAD. This is the part. We just only focused on the OCT to the LMCA. We got an OCT lady, a very tight disease of nearly 1.95 millimeter square, even though the pro distal and proximal part of the lady was very big. This, the distal LMCA is only 5.88, and we got an area of 11.57 in the proximal LMCA. We actually got an area, we just understand that the LAD to LMCA area is actually if you look at the proximal LED is 2.99 ml, the MLA is only 1.95, Ostial LED segment is 1.57 and LMCA. We got a measurement of the LMCA size of 4 mm stent and distally we got a measurement. We did into the circumflex also. We got a 3.12 and the proximal circumflex tight disease, you can see that 1.55 only. And with this measurement, we could identify both the proximal circumflex and proximal LED. Then we did a cutting balloon. We prepared the lesion very well. Same cutting balloon we used for the uh, circumflex also. Then we decided to do a mini crush technique. We used a 2.75 into 15 stent into the circumflex and a 3 millimeter balloon. 
we rewired that all the people asked that the wire should go into the circumflex. This is the first kiss done. After the first kiss, we did a 4 into 28 millimeter stent, science expedition, up to the ostium. We did a port with a 4 into 12 millimeter balloon and keeping the port balloon exactly at the distal part of the carina. Then we took the wire, this is actually recrossing the wire. Everybody wanted to take the wire from the stent into the side branch of the first OIM branch. So I had actually mobilized the wire into that angle and I put the wire into the OIM only, not into the LED, through the stent strut. Then we did an OCT LED to LMCA. The proximal wire crossing was there. You can see the wire is actually not totally cross, almost like a mid cross. We can see the crossing there. This is all not possible with a IVAS. Then we did a balloon dilatation. With the same balloon, we just initially pre-dilated. We manipulated the same balloon down, pushed the balloon down, dilatation. Then we used a 3 into 8 millimeter where we used a 2.75 stain and 4 into 12 millimeter, which is actually used in the LMC. The second kiss, then 4.5 into 8 millimeter. LMCA part finally. This is a pre run, post run. We got an Austral LED which was actually very small and it became very big. I will have a comparison. This is actually the final part. There is no strength start across. This was the pre run which we got 1.95, became 8.76 post run. We got 5.88 in the proximal osteoproximal LED became. 13.1 and 11.6 became 14.9. And this was the final shot. We did not take another shot for the circumflex. Thank you very much. That, that was a great talk. Uh, uh, and you showed very nicely the use of OCT in complex bifurcation lesions. The obvious question arises, and I think I'm going to ask you. Uh, these are complex lesions. We saw complex calcified lesions earlier on, and we talk about imaging in them. And yet, you may be experienced, he's very experienced, I'm very experienced, we've been doing this for years. And then you have the youngster who's been provided this machine. What is easier to understand, learn, and institute uh, in terms of imaging in complex lesions? We agree with the fact that one needs to master Intravascular ultrasound, one needs to master OCT. But what is more intuitive? What is more easier? What, is, what will give the, person, the young, youngster the first step towards optimization of his cases? Exactly, sir. Both the modalities have their own learning curves, but we all know that the interpretation of OCT is far more easier and it is more intuitive. It is auto-suggestive, especially in complex cases like even the calcified lesions and even the bifurcations. Even amongst bifurcations, we know that only one strategy has actually find a way into the guidelines. That's the DK crush. And one of the essential features in mastering DK crush is the wire position, assessing the side branch. So assessing the side branch as sir very rightly said, assessing the side branch on a single pullback on IVAS might not be possible. We have to two, take two pullbacks. But with the OCT, the far field view of the side branch osteo is so easily visible. And with the improvement in their uh, softwares, with the improvement in the auto suggestions, I think so, the learning curve would be far, far easier with OCT. And if given a choice to choose one modality, I think so, it's OCT. Yeah, because, you know, uh, as you know, you, you function in a, in a city where you have to provide those services yeah. and your system cannot, you know, you just can't ask for both. I want IWAS, I want OCT. You have one choice. And I, this, this has re recently occurred in one of the university institutes which rang me to say, you make a choice for us as to which modality should we actually get because you can only afford one of these modalities of imaging. And that's, that's an important aspect for, to, to, to remember and understand. That said, there will always be areas where IVOS would score better. There will always be areas where OCT would score better. But given all comers, we have to choose one if it's OCT. 
So, so of course, the new, new softwares of both devices are getting more and more intuitive and, and self-explanatory. The Ultrion software is amazing in terms of the fact that it can help, uh, not just, uh, not just as it show calcium, but actually measures calcium, measures the arc and gives you the burst spots of, of, uh, of scoring right then and there. And then it's already going into a second generation of Ultrion, which is 2.0 which is even getting more fascinating because it picks up soft plaques and, 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 uh, and therefore uh, fibro fatty plaques. It can give you the landing zones, uh, look at the plaque burden. So I think, but, but uh, IVAS is going along that way as well, but clearly mastering IVAS is an art and science in itself, which takes much longer. And all, all of us have to accept that fact as we transfer imaging down to more and more younger generation of people who need to optimize their patients uh, and, and optimize their results. Yes, sir, actually, uh, the question will come only to you, not to us, you know, which modality to be used in the university. So you actually have the maximum say into these people. But I personally feel that young generation people, people who are starting the, in the uh, imaging modality, they should be well versed with the OCT. And once you just go up to some more steps, and when you start doing more complex, especially for the CTOs and LMC, OSTEM and all, then they may require both the modality. But you have to suggest that the young people also should be well versed with the imaging rather than only doing numbers game in, in interventions. Perfect, perfect uh, comment. Please, Mayesh. So the problem is you show 100 OCT images to the so-called youngsters, they will decipher and tell you exactly, precisely, this is this, this is that. But when you ask them to do it on ground, it doesn't happen because they don't have hands-on training. So we should actually uh, make sure that uh, more people are brought into workshops, uh, trained how to use these images, and then probably they would uh, uh, use it more and be more comfortable with it. You, you're so right. And the MLD Max algorithm is, is a clear definition of how, uh, the per, how, how one is approaching this in a more simplified manner and a more systematic manner. And the Ultrion softwares are now totally relying on the MLD Max to actually pick up these things and give it to you. Artificial intelligence is going to go a long way in, in making sure that we optimize our patients. And I think we need to work towards that very clearly. Uh, so uh, I think we was... Uh, Adrian, do you have any 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 thoughts, any questions, any comments? Yeah, that's true. Also, I think and, that, and that that's I would been go to Aaron. Yeah, yeah it's, it's been a lot of uh, interesting discussion, especially with regards to the new software and learning of uh, youngsters. So I know Dr. Kumar also shared with us uh, the very complex cases, and he detailed the use of uh, 3D OCT imaging. But I think some of uh, us have some reservations with the Ultron software. We understand that it's new, it's, it's uh, relying on artificial intelligence, intelligence to actually make uh, things easier. But uh, they do actually remove the things that uh, the more uh, expert users rely on, like the 3D imaging that uh, Dr. Kumar shared with us. It's not available in the first version. And something which I, I personally find a little disruptive too is the orientation of the vessel. So they've actually flipped it. So proximal is now on the left and the distal is on the right. So for the seasoned user of OCT, you've got to reorientate. But unfortunately, because the FFR is also marketed by Abbott, they haven't actually done that with the FFR pullback. So when you're looking at FFR, you're actually again looking at the distal on the left vis-a-vis -vis the proximal on the right. So I think this is something that uh, so it, it, they should actually consider in the long term, whether while uh, catering software for the young people to make things easier, do they want to give options also to our older operators and options to that uh, the older operators are more familiar with? So the Ultrion software 2.0 has overrides on all the, these issues. You can actually switch on either side. Uh, so you can override a lot of things in Ultrion 2.0 software for the same reason as experienced users felt that they would like to analyze many aspects themselves and they would actually like to reorientate many aspects themselves. So exactly this feedback has been taken. I saw the 2.0 software and then there's gonna be a 3.0 very rapidly also. 
and <laughs> yeah, I have to admit that um, in my practice, uh, because it's a government hospital, cost is an issue, and also it's a busy lab. Using intravascular imaging um, uh, takes out time, and you know um, the case sort of build up getting late. Yeah, so we only use it in, in sort of left main lesions and, and things. I think with, with the um, uh, artificial intelligence and with the automatic sort of interpretation of the thing will, you sh will definitely help uh, to speed up the process and the user will be find it user friendly and you know you don't have to you know spend time think about it and just based on what is is, is interpreted by the machine. Yeah. Uh, so you know, um, all of us, we've had this issue uh, that, you know, when we all started with imaging, it would take more time. And in busy labs, that always becomes a major issue that it takes more time, the learning curve and everything. But I think the only way to, you know, come out of that is to use it more and more because our results definitely get very much better when we use imaging. And the more we use it, the less is the time that is required to reuse it because your technicians and you yourself become so familiar with it that the time taken to do an imaging absolutely comes down. And they've uh, looked at it in various studies that the procedure time is now equivalent. And in some studies, they've also come up with the fact that it reduces the time because it helps you to make decisions very quickly as to what you're supposed to do. So I think the only way to do it is do more and more imaging, better and better results, uh, reduce learning time, and reduce time to do it. Yeah, before uh, Sengu wants to make a comment, but I'd also say, so Dr. Sarita, that let's not uh, give the impression to anybody that if they don't image, they can't optimize. Uh, still, still, the world revolves around financial constraints. It finally goes down to the patient. Uh, I would suggest that every person in the beginning of his career needs to use imaging as a more and more imaging. And as you start sizing those vessels and start realizing the deficiency of angiograms and the fact that you undersize everything based on angiograms, whenever even your angiogram shows you a perfect result, you know that you're 0.5 millimeter smaller sized than, than what it should actually be in larger vessels and at least 0.25 millimeter less. In. And that's when your angiogram looks perfect. So you can imagine how much we undersize our stents and lead to worse outcomes. Once you actually have that in your head and once your eye coordination between the, your coordination between imaging and angiogram is very clear that you need to be bigger than the, the, what you see at the angiogram, then you start using imaging for exactly 100% of the left mains. Then you start using it for practically more complex two-stent bifurcation strategies in calcified vessels. Then you start using it in long and heavily calcified lesions which actually matter those vessels where, 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 uh, un, uh, where, where results actually can make a difference of life or death to the patient and not just restenosis, ambiguous lesions and instant restenosis. That then gets your imaging down to those 20, 25 percent, which is an optimal imaging because to believe that we can't do angioplasty without imaging would be a false sense of, of pro pro proceeding down interventional cardiology. Yeah, no, I just wanted to make a comment on the OC, use of OCT in bifurcation. Uh, I think uh, Pratap uh, said that one of the important things is uh, to detect abluminal wiring and uh, 3D wiring of the uh, appropriate uh, distal strut. The another important area is to assess what we call as a carpet view in the OCT. That is to assess the ostium in a 3D OCT. They look at the struts and you see whether it's a link free type or a link type, and you can know. Whether, because leaving this sometimes causes kind of a, a tissue bridge. I think it was demonstrated by one of the cases with Ronnie Matthew. And to avoid that, by looking at the type with the carpet view, you can decide to use a kitty kissing balloon. Or sometimes you, there's been described a pulling balloon technique where you can push, pushing balloon technique where you can push your inflated balloon in, through into the side branch and thereby open the strut if there's a link, a link uh, type. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you point to be added okay. is that we have got two pullback speeds. So for an optimal assessment of the side branch ostium, it has to be the shorter pullback at a lower speed so that we can, the accuracy is more, the resolution is more. In, in fact, I, should, I, I, I say that that's the only one which should be used if you really want to be accurate in assessments of your lesions. 
That's the only one we should be using. Uh, let's go on to the next talk. Uh, and that uh, would be uh, on an update on Inoka, fiction or underdiagnosed, and uh, Adrian. Sure, thank you, Ashut. I think we're going to switch gears now from very complex uh, intervention. We're going to be dealing with largely normal to looking coronaries. So the following to a potential conflict of interest to declare. And just to start off, uh, so that everyone is on the same grounding, we're going to just uh, clarify some definitions that we're going to be using. So Inoka, I think most people in the audience would agree that it just stands for ischemia and non-obstructive coronary disease. The barium Inoka is refers to the situation where there is myocardial infarction. And with regards to the maze events, uh, it's usually a composite of death and my revascularization. So with the conventional angiography, what we see really are just the epicardial coronaries and anything that's more than 400 microns. But really, that's a huge part of the vessels that we do not see, what we call the microcirculation. And that part is what actually constitutes the majority of the complete coronary circulation. So you can see from this schema here that the 94 in about 95% of the vascular resistance is contributed by the microcirculation. And what we're really dealing with in the epicardial arteries just constitute about 5% of the total vascular resistance. And this part of the circulation that we do not see is responsible for metabolism, the exchange of uh, nutrients on the myocardial bed. So it is a huge part that has not really been appreciated. Now, the modern definition of Inoka is the presence of angina and ischemia, but no obstructive coronary artery disease on coronary angiogram. And as alluded to earlier, there is a, an overlap between the typical Inoka and Minoka, where extreme ischemia resulting in myocardial injury could result in myocardial infarction. One of the problems with the definition of Inoka is how do you define non-obstructive coronary artery disease? Unfortunately, there is no clear consensus based on the geographic definition. Some studies rely on anything less than 50%, some consider 50% as non-obstructive, and some even take a higher threshold of 70%. Now, also just as a background, I think some of us of an older generation will be familiar with the term cardiac syndrome X. While the term cardiac syndrome X refers to chest pain of uncertain etiology, Inoka is actually more specific. So the patient has to have not just angina, but also demonstrable ischemia. Now, the true prevalence of Inoka is difficult to quantify, but at least from a large registry from the US uh, NCDR, looking at more than 400,000 angiogram, they actually surmise that uh, more than 50% of patients have, who have reported chest pains have less than 50% stenosis. We know from clinical experience and from published data that the majority are females, although men are not excluded, and it does have a significant impact on males as well as on the health status of the patient. Inoka is not benign. That's why we're talking about this. And whether you consider an anatomical definition or a functional testing, patients who have Inoka have a higher incidence of adverse outcomes. Now, you can see from this chart here that if you use a functional evaluation, you actually am more to accurate in prediction and it correlates better with adverse outcomes. We know that uh, also that the presence of Inoka, even in the absence of obvious coronary artery disease, do carry a higher MACE rate. And, but it is, of course, lower in contrast to uh, obvious or uh, overt obstructive coronary artery disease. Now, really what is most troublesome to the patient on a day-to-day basis is its impact on the functional status, what we call the presence of symptoms limiting the usual activities of lifestyle, which may not necessarily be life-threatening, but does have a, a significant impact on the quality of life. So how do we assess for the presence of Minoka? And I think this chart briefly summarizes the three main modalities that we use invasively, the CFR, the FFR, and the IMR, to evaluate the whole spectrum of the coronary circulation from the macro to the micro circulation. So we need an angiogram, whether invasive or non-invasively, to exclude high-grade coronary artery disease. And at least for now, the easiest test is 
the invasive measures of functional significance. Although what is emerging are the non-invasive tests like MRI, heart perfusion test, and cardiac PET. But this are actually less available in most of the centers, in, not only in Singapore, but like would foresee in large parts of Asia. So I'm going to just go in depth into the evaluation of the functional significance using an invasive modality, specifically FFR, CFR, and IMR, and also the role of evaluating coronary artery spasm. Now, because uh, this is a broad audience here, just uh, for introduction, I'm going to just run through some of these parameters that we use. The coronary flow reserve, or CFR, is actually one of the oldest index that we use to evaluate the coronary circulation. Basically, this whole concept of CFR stems from the fact of autoregulation, that in a normal to a basal state, there is a normal microvascular tone limiting blood flow to the heart, as like in any organ system in the body. And when there is a need for more blood flow, there is then epicardial arterial dilatation, resulting in increased flow. Now what happens in the patient who has an epicardial stenosis is that there is already partial microvascular dilatation because of this autoregulation, hence the increase in the vasodilatation is much less, and this accounts for the lower coronary flow reserve, or CFR. The concept of fractional flow reserve actually came later, after the CFR, because of technical challenges and less appreciation of what is the normal coronary flow reserve. And it's the basis is that during condition of maximum hyperemia, there's a linear correlation of blood flow to the pressure differential. Hence, you can define the fractional flow reserve as the ratio of the maximum flow in the presence of narrowing to a theoretical maximum flow in the absence of narrowing. What this means in layman terms is what's the resultant percentage blood flow due to the narrowing that you see in the epicardial artery. So for example, if you define the FFR as 0.75 from a proximal to stenosis, what you're saying is that that narrowing results in a 25% reduction in blood flow. And what's generally regarded uh, as significant now in our daily practice is an FFR of 0 0.80. IMR, or Index of Microcirculatory Resistance, correlates very well with a true microcirculatory resistance and can be derived similarly during the condition of uh, hyperemia. Hence, the three indices that we use to get an idea of whether a patient has uh, evidence of microvascular dysfunction are coronary flow reserve, the FFR, as well as the IMR. And this you can actually obtain it fairly easily, especially if you use appropriate software, the Coroventis system in particular. And why do we want to do this? Now, by having the, these three measures, you can actually define the endotype. The endotype, in essence, is a subtype of a disease condition. The analogy would be like anemia. You say someone has anemia, but what sort of anemia does he have? Does he have iron deficiency anemia or some other cause of anemia? So similarly now, we're now down to a little more specific definition of what is the cause of ischemia or enoka. Now, by having these three measures, you can classify the patient as having microvascular engineer, vasospastic engineer, with the addition of acetylcholine, or a mixed picture. Now the Cormica trial I bring up because it is the first trial that actually demonstrate a usefulness in measuring these modalities in clinical practice and in our daily practice. Because this trial, which was a large study involving two major hospitals in Scotland, demonstrated that the comprehensive evaluation of the microcirculation enables you to define or categorize the patient into four main uh, endotypes. Microvascular engineer itself, vasospastic engineer, a mixed condition, or non-cardiac chance pain. And the protocol that they employ is first the, the use of hyperemia to define the CFR, the FFR, and the IMR, and thereafter they proceed with escalating doses of acetylcholine looking for coronary vasospasm. In my lab, we follow a similar protocol, except that we use papaverine, and we use a higher dose of acetylcholine based on the German protocol, who have a huge experience, and we find that this makes the test a lot more sensitive. And basically, by performing this test, you evaluate the patient for the presence of vasospastic engineer, microvascular engineer, or else non-cardiac chest pain. And 
what this study demonstrated was that patients have a clear improvement in their Seattle engineer questionnaire, and this resulted in an improvement in quality of life. And the results were durable to up to a year. So I think this is the first study that demonstrate the effectiveness of this strategy in clinical practice, albeit it's not a hard conventional maze outcome that we look for in the various stand trials, but none of that, the less it does have a meaningful impact on the patient's life. So to, uh, to illustrate that, I have just two cases I'd like to share with you. The first is a 45-year-old woman who has a long-standing history of chest pain dating back to before the 2015s. And because of recurrent chest pain, she had an angiogram done in 2016 that documented normal coronaries, but an aberrant right coronary artery. Subsequent to that, she had a CT angiogram to define the cause of the right coronary artery because of persistent pain and an exercise maybe in 2020, again because of persistent pain, demonstrated this perfusion defect, as you can see in the, the chart here. Now, because of her long-standing history of chest pain, she was actually referred to the surgeons who was considering a de-roofing of the right coronary arteries. So she was referred to us for an opinion also for coronary evaluation. And this is the right coronary artery. It looks um, completely normal. We just had to do a function evaluation, and you can see that the right coronary artery has an FFR of 0.94. CFR is clearly normal at 5.1. IMR is also normal at 24. And when we look at the LED, it has no obvious coronary stenosis. The FFR was reduced. It's not uh, abnormal by conventional standard. The CFR was lower. The IMR was increased, suggesting the presence of microvascular dysfunction. Additionally, with the administration of acetylcholine, you see that she does actually demonstrate 90% stenosis in the mid to distal segment of the LED, and also with it provoke angina and ECG changes. So the patient has evidence of both microvascular dysfunction as well as basospastic angina. So she was actually uh, told that the surgery may not be necessary at this time, but this further tweaking of her medicines was performed and she had symptomatic improvement. The second case is another middle-aged woman who has uh, evidence of connective tissue disease, specifically SLE, progressing to systemic sclerosis. She was also troubled by effort dyspnea for six months, and on admission, there was some borderline elevation of the troponin, suggesting possibly of a, of a, a myocardial infarction. The echocardiography was normal. The ECG showed non-specific STT changes, as we not uncommonly see in these patients. So she was brought to the cath lab, and this is a collage of the coronary angiogram, and you can see that it is grossly normal. So again, we proceeded the functional evaluation of the LED, and it shows the FFR 0.94, the CFR is 3.3, but the RMR is clearly elevated at 45. So she was treated for, as for microvascular dysfunction and has symptomatic improvement. So what do we know now about this spectrum of ischemic heart diseases? For the this session, we have largely concentrated on focal epicardial disease, diffuse epicardial disease, but we are now increasingly aware of this entity called microvascular dysfunction and also epicardial vasospasm that contribute to this ischemic heart disease spectrum. And why is it important to know this? It's important because if you can define what the patient actually has, you can actually personalize treatment. What's not available in this uh, part of the world except in Japan is Fasudu, which is a row kinase inhibitor, a drug that has been shown to be very useful in patients with uh, coronary artery spasm. But certainly, you know, having the, the ability to define the endotype of angina will actually guide treatment for these patients. So what take home messages do I have? The first is that Inoka is real and we need to have uh, increased vigilance for it. So, to, for a comprehensive evaluation of coronaries, we need to go beyond just looking at obstructive coronary artery disease, even with the use of uh, intravascular imaging. But perhaps we would want in the appropriate patient to go in depth to evaluate the physiology so that we can better define the presence or absence of microvascular dysfunction or vasospasm because this could have an important impact on the patient's lifestyle. Thank you. So, Adrian, um, we have time. Yeah, we have time for a couple of questions. But uh, my question to you is, at the end of the day, the diagnosis is an interesting aspect of a condition which has only drug therapy. 
and therefore you're sitting in the outpatients and you have a patient who complains of chest pain and this happens to us, you know, a lot, whereby we're not certain whether this is uh, a musculoskeletal pain or we just dismiss it as a non-cardiac and so on and so forth. But then you've got to investigate that further. So are you therefore suggesting that the only way to do that is invasive testing? Uh, primarily because even if it, uh, firstly, there could be non-invasive testing that we could do. Secondly, why not just give them vasodilators and, and trimetazidine and see what's happening to them? I, I think this, uh, you put, uh, brought up a very good point, which is the practical aspect of how do you deal with these patients, because we see patients with chest pains all the time. And I have to be honest that I don't routinely send all my patients with chest pains for a full functional evaluation, but it's really the selective patients. So patients whom you, who fail to a conventional treatment, say, and where it's affecting their quality of life so much that you really want to help them get a better understanding of their situation. So I don't routinely send them for this comprehensive evaluation at first visit. But most times these patients are referred to me because they have been troubled by years of chest pain and they are kind of fed up because the doctors that they see tell them it's all in their head. They don't see anything in the coronaries. There's nothing wrong with them, so they should see a psychiatrist. And some patients actually do feel justified when we actually demonstrate an organic cause for their symptoms. They feel that they have been vindicated because they feel that they have been wrongly accused, that it's all in their head, that they have nothing wrong with them. And to have an objective measure that there is something not quite normal actually helps them dealing with the situation too. I think in fu the future is really non-invasive stress tests, just as CT angiogram is now to increasingly used in our practice. I think with the availability of MRI perfusion, PET imaging, I think there will come a time where we're, using, we're going to be using these invasive measures less and less. Uh, I, I, can I have? Please, uh, please. I just want to ask you one question. One is this uh, uh, provocative testing for epicardial spasm. I mean, do you do it routinely? But, but it's because you don't need anything specific for that. But is there a risk of uh, doing that? And do you do it routinely for all normal coronaries? And also, I want to ask you about the Scorovin test software. Is it available widely? Okay, great. Yeah, so to, uh, with regards to the first point on the safety of acetylcholine testing, I think it has been demonstrated to be very safe. There's been some recent publications from the German group, specifically Peter Ong, who has done more than two, 3,000 coronary artery spasm using acetylcholine, and they've not demonstrated mortality. The common side effects is really that of bradycardia, which can be reversed easily with GTN or in more serious situations with atropine. So it's generally safe, yes. And we use uh, acetylcholine too, it, rather than agonavin, which was the drug previously used. And I think it's only used uh, mainly in Japan now. But I think the rest of the world has actually transitioned to using acetylcholine for coronary artery spasm. Again, I don't uh, do this routinely, mainly because of uh, logistic reasons, yeah. But I do, I would say, almost routinely do uh, at least evaluate for microvascular dysfunction because I actually prefer FFR to the rest index. So if I'm doing uh, FFR evaluation, I'm inducing hyperemia, I might as well just get these additional parameters, which I find it useful in my understanding of the patient and which also can provide incremental information in how you want to deal with them. And the other point with regards to the availability of the Carl Venti software, I think it should be readily available. I think you just need to speak to your Abbott rep and ask them, when are you getting it? <laughs> I, I think we, we should uh, close. We are over time. And uh, I think we've had a great session, one and a half hours of true intellectual discussions from the experts, and uh, we certainly, I don't think we've simplified the complex, but we certainly understood it better. And uh, with us, thank you very much, the audience, for being an active participant to this session, and thank you, the speakers and panelists, for such a great uh, session with, uh, with full of knowledge. Thank you. <laughs>